All right, thank you everyone for joining us. Welcome to the Duke University Media Briefing on Dog Psychology during this return to work phase of the pandemic. Today, we'll be covering a mix of practical tips for dog owners and also some of the underlying science of canine cognition. I'm Amanda Soliday with Duke Communications in Durham, North Carolina. And to get started, I'd like to introduce our panelist, which sadly is not a puppy, <laughs> but we're happy to have Brian Hare here. He's a professor of evolutionary anthropology, and he's the co-director of the Duke Canine Cognition Center. The center tests dogs brought in voluntarily by their owners to better understand the cognitive abilities of the animals. Hare's book on dog psychology, The Genius of Dogs, was a New York Times bestseller written with co-author co Vanessa Woods. They also wrote another recent book, Survival of the Friendliest. First, we have a couple opening questions and afterwards the, there will be plenty of time for Q&A. So for our opening question, Professor Hare, to begin with, could you tell us a little bit more about the research at the Canine Cognition Center? Absolutely, and thank you for the invitation. Thank you for everyone who's here with us. Uh, I am the director of the Duke Canine Cognition Center, and there we have really student-run research that is all about trying to ask questions uh, about the psychology of dogs, how they solve problems, how they don't solve problems, uh, and then how we can apply that information to uh, solve real, real, real world problems. Um, so for instance, we're involved in trying to help selecting dogs uh, for work, things like uh, dogs that are trained to find bombs or dogs that help people with disabilities. So uh, we, we have our hands full trying to figure out both how dogs uh, solve problems and think and then how we can apply that uh, to the real world. Very cool, thank you. Um, so to get to the subject at hand today, I one of the things that I think it's worth recognizing, there's obviously been a great amount of disruption this past year or more. And uh, what, what, one of the things I'd like to know as a species, how do dogs tend to handle change? And is there anything in their species history or physiology that informs this response? Yes, so um, uh, absolutely. During the pandemic, everybody has uh, um, obviously been under a lot of stress and there's uh, been a lot of reason for anxiety. Um, and uh, so what, what about dogs? Uh, what can we expect uh, for our uh, best friends, pets, family members and how they can cope with all of this? Um, uh, and it ends up that it is, it is the case that dogs um, through domestication uh, are a much more relaxed uh, less anxious species. Uh, that's actually the main impact that domestication has had uh, on dogs is to make them really interested in people, uh, to be less anxious uh, relative to wolves. Um, and that allows them to live in our houses and be family members. Um, I think the challenge though, is there's still a lot of individual variability um, so even though they're different from wolves, it doesn't mean that every dog is like, you know, sitting around being totally relaxed all the time. Um, there's a lot of individual variability. Uh, there's a difference uh, that could be heritable, maybe even because of how a dog has been bred. Uh, there's also individual variability because of how a dog has been reared. Um, and that's really the main concern about the pandemic is that um, especially dogs that were puppies during the pandemic may have had some um, uh, it may have uh, missed out on some experiences uh, that might make them a little bit more relaxed uh, for the rest of their lives. Um, and so that individual variability uh, is what then can cause, um, you know, challenges for people and behavioral, what people would see as a behavior problem in their dog um, and may, uh, you know, lead to problems in that relationship. Great, thank you. And we'll, we'll come back to that as we talk about some tips for owners. Um, I wanted to open up the, the um, room for questions. Thank you to everyone who submitted questions in advance. We'll, we'll start there. And you can also pose questions via the Q&A window. If you would like to ask your question in person, you can raise your hand in Zoom. And if you're calling in by phone, you can raise your hand by pressing star nine. And, and thanks to everyone watching on YouTube. 
So uh, Brian, you already touched on this. Here's one of our advanced questions. Um, is there any evidence that pets acquired during the pandemic are behaving differently um, than pets who entered homes at other times? And how can owners help socialize them if that's the case? Yeah, um, so I do think based on uh, uh, adoption data and also just Google searches that especially the the as the pandemic um, sort of reached its peak uh, about a year ago, there was a peak in um, uh, interest in adopting uh, dogs and cats um, and, you know, getting a new uh, pet at home. I think people knew they'd be at home and be a good opportunity to sort of raise an animal where they could, uh, they had the time uh, and they'd be at home. Um, I think that uh, in terms of, is there evidence that there's been a problem? Um, you know, uh, not yet, I would say. I would say it's more of a prediction that as more and more people go back to work, especially um, with dogs, but with other animals as well, um, uh, that you might start to have problems either with uh, separation anxiety or forms of separation anxiety. Um, and potentially uh, dogs that were raised during the pandemic and didn't get a lot of exposure to different people uh, and uh, different dogs because of needs for quarantine that um, they may have problems with anxiety related to social interactions. And so it's more a prediction based on what we know is necessary during critical, the critical period of socialization in a young dog's life. So from, from, a, from a dog's mind, how, how do they interpret this change? When, when all of a sudden owners are absent? How do, how do they see that? Yeah, so I think if, if you've had a dog at home uh, and you've been really at home most of the time doing work from home and now you are gonna be leaving the house more often and especially a dog that was raised when, um, you know, as a young puppy, maybe from eight to 24 weeks, that's sort of a critical time for dogs to learn to be alone. Um, occasionally, uh, but if, if, if a dog during that period hasn't had that chance to learn to be alone in a different room or maybe while you leave the house uh, to go on a walk uh, without the dog, which of course is counterintuitive because uh, of course, you know, you want to take your dog, especially a young puppy on a walk, um, then a dog without that kind of experience of being alone when now you have to go back to work could have a lot of anxiety um, and they might express that with behaviors that really are, would be bothersome in your household. It could be anything from um, uh, the way they express that anxiety is often um, damaging uh, furniture or doors as they're being anxious and scratching or maybe chewing things. Um, maybe they go to the bathroom, maybe they whine, cry, howl. Uh, and bother a neighbor. Um, and this type of behavior is one of the leading causes for people to um, uh, sort of think about uh, uh, placing their dog in a shelter. So um, that's why if you're somebody who cares about dogs, you wanna help people think this through. And so um, that's why um, some pretty easy steps to, um, uh, as you go back to work, as you're leaving your dog alone more and more, you can kind of, uh, don't introduce it all at once, uh, sort of, uh, don't just rip the bandaid off as it were, sort of slowly introduce the idea that you're gonna be leaving some. And then I think a lot of those types of behaviors might be uh, uh, reduced significantly. Great, thank you. How, how long do you think this transition period should ideally be for dogs? Yeah, so I think if you are in a household where, um, you know, you have really been uh, with your dog for the most of the time, if you, um, uh, you know, haven't been able to leave your dog for long periods of time, you know, if you're going to go back nine to five, you know, five days a week, but you've been at home most of the time, um, you know, dogs uh, are an animal and why we love them is they socially bond with us. Um, and free ranging dogs, uh, domesticated dogs and wolves, um, uh, they make choices all day long about who they're going to be with and where they're going to be. But typically they want to be with somebody. Um, and dog pet dogs are bonded most with us. Um, they really want to be with humans. Uh, so even having another pet in the house isn't necessarily helpful to them. Um, so what I'm trying to say is that 
uh, this is something that's a big deal for a dog. If you have been around home most of the time, and now you're going to go back and be gone 40, 50 hours a week. Um, and so if you can, a few weeks before you go back, um, uh, sort of increase increments of time during the day, uh, that you uh, leave your dog at least in a different room. Um, if they're crate trained, you can give them some alone time in their crate. Uh, if um, you uh, you know could could leave the house to go shopping or whatever, and start with small, you know, even if it's you know five ten minutes, um, and increase that increment over days. Uh, I'm sure your dog would uh, respond really positively, especially if you take your time with it. Thank you. Uh, there, so there are also a lot of gadgets. I mean, I'm thinking, I haven't, I haven't used this for my dog myself, but I'm thinking of like baby monitors and I know, and I know people use them for their pets. Is there, is there any evidence that you could set up a monitor and it would have any positive effect on your dog? Yeah, no, I, I would strongly encourage uh, anyone who's worried or seeing signs of stress in their dogs and dogs shows, especially when they're leaving, signs of stress would be sort of licking their lips, um, uh, any kind of yawning behavior uh, as you're leaving. Um, obviously, if they become agitated and they're whining, um, those are all signs that, um, you know, gosh, they may be experiencing some anxiety right now. And so that would be, uh, you know, sort of a, a clue that, huh, maybe I should set up one of these uh, cameras, um, especially near where you leave, where you exit, uh, and just monitor and see, um, are they really having a hard time? How are they, are they able to calm down relatively quickly? Um, uh you know, or is it that it's something that uh, you need to um, maybe take some steps to help your dog uh, um, uh, deal with the anxiety from you leaving? Thank you. We have one question in the Q&A from Josh Zach. So he, he asked, when it comes to pet owners, um, as many people might have been first time pet owners during the pandemic, is there any concern that, um, and an animal's acclimation to real life will be more or less turbulent compared to a seasoned pet owner who's got a lifetime of experience with training. So is there any difference between first time pet owners versus people who have had dogs before? Or is I my, my own question that's related, is there anything even seasoned dog owners should know that might be different now? Yeah, I think, you know, the, I think if you're, whether you're a seasoned dog owner or a first time uh, dog owner, the two uh, challenges we have with dogs is that uh, dogs are xenophobic. Um, they tend to be afraid of or um, nervous around strange people and strange uh, dogs. They can, and, and there's tremendous individual variability, but as a species, um, that's the case. Um, and then uh, they also, um, you know, are very socially bonded and they bond to individuals uh, in our family. And so um, both of those things are very healthy re responses uh, in a dog that's been socialized and met lots of dogs when they're a young puppy and had lots of play time and experiences. Um, uh, a dog that's bonded with his family, but, you know, has had time to be alone and has alone time during that critical sort of developmental window um, you know, they're going to be able to be alone. And even if they, um, even if like I have an adult dog at home and we were home all the time. Um, but because he was socialized that way, as we started leaving more, it didn't really bother him. We did it incrementally and he hasn't really had any problem at all. Um, so I would just say that, um, you know, what I worry about the most, whether you're an experienced dog owner or not, is a, is a young dog that didn't have that alone time when they're puppies, um, or maybe didn't get to meet a lot of people and a lot of different dogs during that socializ socialization window. They're going out into the world and, and, and you know, some of the things that um, might not be scary or anxiety inducing uh, are now potentially frightening, could lead to expressions of aggression. Uh, and of course, if you haven't had that time alone uh, when you were young, um, you know, you might have separation anxiety. And then there's the good news is there's steps to take. Yeah, so so what are some of the, the steps that owners can take to socialize their dog? What are the different ways 
So yeah. So if you, it, so if you have a puppy and you need to socialize your dog, um, you know, that's where you have that critical window between about eight and 24 weeks um, uh, to sort of get your, you know, get your dog uh, out and meet other dogs um, and um, also give them some alone time. Uh, and, you know, uh, one of the challenges, even before the pandemic, uh, when you have a young dog that you need to socialize is you also have to be worried about their vaccinations um, because uh, if they, uh, for instance, haven't had their Parvovax, it's extremely uh, contagious uh, disease. Um, and so you want to limit contact because you're trying to protect them from Parvo, but they need the socialization and interaction with other dogs so that they can grow up and be a normally interacting um, socialized dog. So um, add the pandemic on top of that. And, and that's why the worry is that um, as people go back um, and um, uh, leave their dogs alone, we're, we might uh, have problems. But in terms of steps you can take um, as you go back, I think, uh, first of all, there's great resources. Um, uh, there's the Association of Pet Dog uh, Trainers, um, uh, and they're a, a fantastic association of uh, certified dog trainers. Um, obviously, uh, there are behavioral uh, uh, veterinarians that, um, uh, for instance, at North Carolina State here in North Carolina, that can help uh, advise with a dog that really has significant problems. Um, and then I think the simplest is, uh, you know, if you can, if you can afford and if you have the ability to um, try out doggy daycare for a dog that might uh, need some extra help as you transition, even if you do it for a few weeks as you, um, you know, help them uh, adjust, uh, or uh, maybe there's a dog walker that you could use to um, uh, give your dog a little bit of a, of a bridge as you transition back. So I think uh, all those types of resources could help. Um, and uh, yeah, I think um, is, if you uh, think it through, I think most dogs are gonna be able to handle uh, these kinds of changes. Um, and hopefully we won't see a big uptick in uh, dogs being returned to shelters, uh, et cetera. Thank you, that's a great list of tips. Um, we have, we have another question. Um, someone was, was wondering if it's counterproductive to show more affection during, during this period when you're away. Yeah, that's that. a good, so I had a dog that uh, had separation anxiety um, and it is the, uh, it is advised that as you're leaving uh, that you don't make a big ceremony out of it. And as you return, you don't make a big ceremony out of it. And it does seem a little bit of a bummer. I'm somebody who is, loves to uh, get excited with my dog, uh, you know, but if a dog is, is showing some of the separation anxiety behaviors, um, they're barking, howling, um, scratching, um, you know, soiling the house uh, as you're away. Um, and some dogs have this for, if you're away for a few minutes, um, and so if you have a dog like that, then definitely it's time to think about maybe, um, uh, you know, sort of keeping things super calm as you're leaving and returning. Um, and in fact, things that may signal you're leaving, you may want to, so, so you know, jingling of keys, um, putting on shoes, you might want to do that out of sight of the dog um, uh, as they get adjusted, uh, acclimated uh, to the new uh, regime. Thank you. Uh, so if, if your dog is having problems with anxiety and you take your pet to a vet, one of the, the common ways vets handle pet stress um, might be to prescribe medication or sedatives. Um, I was wondering how, if, if you see that as part of the toolkit or um, where you see that in, in, in this sort of phase of preparing dogs to be apart from their owners more. Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, part of our culture is uh, fix it quick, fix it with a pill. Um, and there certainly is evidence that, um, and I wouldn't discourage anybody to consider that option. Um, and, you know, your veterinarian is going to be the one that has the appropriate expertise there. But um, I would say that most cases of separation anxiety in particular um, can be handled um, with some uh, compassion and time uh, and planning. 
Um, so if you can slowly increase that interval of the dogs um, alone, if you can actually make it something positive, um, for instance, a dog that's crate trained, um, if you can, uh, you know, leave them their Kong with some peanut butter in it. And, uh, you know, if you can um, uh, maybe even, um, you know, it, take them on, a, on long walks before you leave so they're exhausted. Uh, and so then getting in that kennel or, you know, going to the place where they're going to be uh, alone during their alone time is actually a wonderful thing. I'm exhausted. I'm going to take a nap, uh, get a Kong toy with some peanut butter. And, uh, you know, the human's not making it a big deal um, when they leave. I, I think a lot of cases can be solved that way if you think about it incrementally and start small. I mean, in some cases, the worst cases, we're talking some dogs that can't even be away from an owner. And this was the way my dog was that had separation anxiety. I mean, a few seconds and he would start to howl and you just slowly build up those times and uh, be patient and you can get there. Thank you. I made a mental note of that tip. I think I'm bad about <laughs> getting excited um, when I see my dog again. Uh, so we have another question in the Q&A from Jennifer Sorber. She was wondering uh, if there's a time frame when your dog should be okay with you leaving. And she said she, she assumes that it's after this transition period that we're talking about. Is, is um, there a um, I'm not sure I understand the question. Is there a time uh, that it should be okay for your dog? Yeah, okay with, with I, think, I think she's wondering, is, is it um, weeks or months for this? this transition for dogs to be okay with you leaving? Ah, uh, I see, I see. Yeah. Well, if it's a dog, uh, so there, I, I would put the dogs, it's sort of, sort of two categories of dogs. They're dogs that um, were socialized when they were young. So an older adult dog, like my own dog, um, I think a transition back to work, um, you know, you can probably do it in a few days, a few weeks, whatever, no problem. Um, sorry, I should say a few days, not a few weeks. Um, no problem, They're, they've been socialized, they will remember. Um, and most dogs who've had that experience as a young dog and throughout their lives, reminding them, hey, I'm gonna leave sometime. Um, I don't think that as long as you kind of do it gradually and give them some, give them some uh, you know, practice, like don't just leave for nine hours a day, five days a week, uh, you know, um, uh, all of a sudden, uh, I think those dogs will be fine. The ones I worry about more, and I think that's back to the original question, is there any evidence? I think there is evidence that dogs who haven't had alone time when they're young um, uh, will probably, uh, the prediction is they're gonna struggle the most. And so dogs that were raised as puppies during the quarantine, um, those are the dogs I think people are, are most worried about when people have to return uh, to work. Um, you know, uh, five days a week and 40 hours, um, are those dogs gonna be okay? Thank you. Uh, we have another question. This, this one's kind of a fun one. Um, so have you, have you seen any employers um, who are allowing dogs uh, at the workplace more? Do you think this is a good idea post pandemic? Or at, at, I, I can't say post pandemic yet, but at this phase in the pandemic. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, moving towards post pandemic, I hope. Oh, um, <laughs> so, so uh, yeah, I have uh, read that there are employers who are um, increasingly, uh, as the pandemic um, uh, has um, slowed down, let's say, uh, have become more open to the idea of people bringing pets into the workplace. Um, and uh, partly because, you know, having that um, a motivation and reason to come into work is, um, you know, increased if you can bring your dog. And um, so I think that's uh, one of the reasons is to incentivize that. Um, but uh, in terms of, is it a good idea? Uh, you know, I'm a dog lover. I spend all my time thinking and writing and, and uh, studying dogs. Um, so obviously I'm going to be a big fan of that, but uh, I do think we as dog lovers, uh, we need to be super respectful of people who uh, may not be as enthusiastic or excited about dogs, because it is true, uh, based on some of the best estimates we have, that um, you know around half of Americans are bitten by a dog at some point in their life, um, and 
so there's a lot of people who are phobic, are really have a real fear of dogs, um, and that's not um, based on nothing. It's you know there are uh, people who have bad interactions with dogs, and um, so you know being respectful of that um, is important. The other thing is that that um, you know there are people who are allergic to dogs, and there's a lot of conversation about hypoallergenic dogs. Um, unfortunately. Um, uh, I, as a scientist, uh, I have to report science that people like and people don't like, and this is one that people don't like, is there's no evidence whatsoever that breeds that are um, reported to somehow uh, not shed the, uh, not shed as much, uh, or somehow, uh, you know, cause less allergies. Um, there's, there's an enzyme in the saliva of dogs that actually gets on their dander and on their hair that causes the allergic reaction. And when that's been measured in different breeds, uh, it doesn't matter if they're marketed as hypoallergenic or not, they're shedding that uh, enzyme at the exact same level. And there's really no evidence that dogs uh, are different in, in that regard. So um, unfortunately, that means we have to be very sensitive to people who have allergies too. Oh, darn. <laughs> I can't handle more bad news, Brian, <laughs> right now. Uh, well, that, that's really good to know. I, I wanted to go back to something you said earlier. Um, so you touched on the difference between dogs and wolves. And I know your, your lab published a paper earlier this week where you were comparing dog puppies to wolf puppies. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the ways that dogs have co-evolved with humans that, that um, in, in this instance might make them more or less resilient to, to transitions. Yeah, one of the things we study is the impact of domestication on dog psychology. And we had a new paper published in Current Biology this week where we compared this, the early socialization period of uh, dog puppies and um, uh, wolf puppies. Uh, and we were able to show uh, that dog puppies are, um, they, they're basically uh, much more attracted to humans, they're much more interested in humans, um, and uh, they are better at understanding us uh, cognitively in terms of how we communicate with them, even at a very, very young age before we've even uh, actively trained them. So really dogs are prepared to bond with us, to understand us in a way that young wolves are not. And we think that uh, this is a, a product of domestication. Um, so, uh, you know, I think that's what sets up the potential for this wonderful relationship we have. But again, there's tremendous individual variability within dogs um, based on uh, how they've historically been bred, uh, based on their rearing experiences, based on the environment they're living in, um, and so uh, I would say, uh, you know, uh, there are still lots of behavioral challenges as pet owners we face um, uh, because of those other factors. Thank you. Uh, so it's about time to wrap up and I have a closing question for you, Professor Hare. Uh, do you think the new wave of dog owners during the pandemic will open up new avenues of research for your lab or, or other researchers in the field? Uh, I do. I mean, all the work we do is um, we don't, uh, we, we, all the dogs we study are people's pet dogs. They bring them into Duke. Uh, people sign up uh, and they bring their dog in to play games that undergraduates run. So, you know, people with more pets uh, means there's going to be more uh, individual dogs to study. I think now we've got a, a group of dogs that were raised uh, in a, a new, different way. And so we'll be interested to see how that, that uh, impacts them. Um, one thing that I would, and one funny fact to leave on uh, for dog owners that I was surprised at, uh, to learn, I was uh, surprised at to learn was that um, when you take your dog on a walk, and this is going to seem out of nowhere, but I would be remiss in not reporting this because I just think this is fascinating as, a, as somebody who's raised a lot of puppies and somebody who takes dogs on walks all the time. Uh, I was under the impression that when you take a dog out and they go to the bathroom, they're done. Um, but there's, there's actual research that shows that dogs um, defecate at least two to three times uh, every time they need to go to the bathroom. So uh, I think the thing that, uh, if, if I could give you a, a strange dog fact to leave on, <laughs> uh, a fun strange dog fact is that um, when they go to the bathroom, they don't um, uh, finish in one bout. They need to go 
uh, especially when they defecate, they need to go multiple times. So if you're on a walk and you're trying to go out and leave your dog out, uh, leave your dog at home and let them go to the bathroom before you do, um, it's almost certain that if they have one bout, they're not done. And if you leave for a long period of time, they're going to be really uncomfortable. Um, so that's my last fun dog uh, tip that's based on somebody actually counting how many bouts uh, dogs have when they go to the bathroom. Oh, oh my goodness. I had, I had no idea. And it <laughs> seems like the members of the audience didn't either because we have a, we have a, a few questions. Uh, someone wanted to know if that's the same for urination. Uh, urination, uh, it is uh, typically um, uh, for a female dog, usually uh, a single bout. Uh, and a male dog, it can really vary, um, but the but it's not as regular as the defecation that tends to be two to three bouts. Okay. Okay. Great. I think we'll we'll end on the urination and defecation <laughs> for today. It's important. It's important. <laughs> um, yeah. It looks like we we don't have any more questions at the moment. And I just, I guess, I just want to thank everyone for joining us and, and thank you to our, our panelist, Brian Hare, for sharing your perspective. Um, so Duke hosts these weekly media briefings. Um, if you'd like to attend the next event, event um, you can email dukenews at duke.edu. And of course, don't forget to like and subscribe on YouTube. In the meantime, please take care of yourself and your pets. Thank you. Thank you.